Uh, and I, yes, I'm going to give you a very, very brief introduction on uh, XMAP tools and what it can do. And, but I, I will not go through each step in, in too much details, just because we don't have uh, time for that. But I want to start with a, a personal comment on the, on the metamorphic rocks. And Dave started the workshop saying that the rocks are always right and, uh, and that the models are uh, always wrong by definition. And I want to say that the rocks are also, and I think everyone would agree with me, very beautiful. And this is a, an example of a, a blue schist, a glaucophane epitope blue schist from Cirrus. And, and I, when, I, when I, look, I look at this image, it's optical image, then it, it, it is a fantastic image and fantastic uh, a rock. But when you go to chemistry, somehow it is similar. And now we are switching to chemistry and we are looking at uh, iron oxide content in minerals for exactly the same area. And wow, the complexity is quite high. And we have zoning in the phases. We, we see different phases. We have the, the shape here. Uh, uh, we have a shape of uh, a probably a form of mineral, and then uh, we have some products uh, precipitating in the middle. So it, it is quite complicated, and, and that's what I want to 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 discuss really here is all to to try to inspire you and to 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 encourage you to to try to acquire those maps and investigate your samples in a different way. You can be using XMAP tools or any other program; it doesn't make a huge difference. So you, you have already seen this figure. Uh, so the goal is really to go from this semi-quantitative uh, X-ray map that you measure the electron microprobe. And most of you have done that already once. Uh, it, it's pretty easy. Um, and then we want to go to a quantitative uh, data set. It can be first a silica map in weight percent, can be a structural formula. But to go from here to here, we need to, to calibrate our uh, X-ray uh, maps. And I, in this example, just to, to, to give you an idea, it, it's about 350,000 pixels for 15 elements. Uh, it's between 10 hours and 40 hours to measure this map, depending on the dwell time. So one night, you can usually do it in one night. And the data processing to get to the, to the, the fully quantitative data set would be one to two hours if you are a relatively experienced user. I would say even less than one hour. Uh, sometime and you get everything out of this uh, the maps of structural formula you can extract local color compositions i think i, I already uh, described that quite in some details so you can use xmap tools if you want to do that uh, uh, quickly it's uh, it's a free uh, matlab dependent software solution and i would say one of the advantage for you as a metamorphic petrologist is developed by a petrologist and there are many tools that are really focused on uh, applications in metamorphic petrology. Compared to commercial softwares, there is no secret algorithm or obscure data reduction uh, scheme. Uh, we try to publish all the algorithms and the source code is, is uh, mostly a viable, if not all, I'm very happy to, to provide the source code and, and it will soon become uh, fully open access. It's free for academic research, and it has a quite large community of users uh, today, not only in metamorphic petrology, it goes now beyond that. Uh, it's largely compatible with uh, electron microprobe data, SCM, and also more recently, we developed quite a few tools for laser ICPMS data. I'm not going to show you that because it's not the focus of the workshop, but you can handle uh, trace element maps quite easily in XMAP tools. We have modules to plot spider diagrams and so on. So this is a uh, quite uh, nice to use. I, I, I used to say that, uh, I like to say that XMAP tools is a set of tools for quantitative petrology. Uh, it's divided in, in the main uh, graphical user interface, shown on the left, there are some other interfaces, uh, chemical modules in the center, and you have already seen the add-ons. So for the main interface, it's a guided environment for uh, classification, so to go from the X-ray maps with the, the 15 elements to uh, mineral maps, you can use uh, uh, the, this, uh, the graphical user interface for standardization uh, to calibrate your maps, to do any kind of normalization you like, for example, to calculate a structural formula, and you can extract data. So you can always come back to the map, uh, draw a transect, extract the profile along the transect. You can uh, use a, a strip, a stripe, you can, you, you can really ex export local bulk composition and so on. There is a, a quite 
a large a variety of tools to export compositions. And you can even export compositions with their uncertainty propagated to the structural formula. And this is quite, this is not always that you can have the uncertainty on the, on the end member fractions, for example. And that's quite useful when you want to look at the isoplets in your diagram. You have some chemical uh, modules you can uh, visualize uh, for data exploration, visualization of your data in uh, uh, binary diagrams and ternary diagrams. I'm going to show you an example. Uh, later on, you can produce RGB images uh, combining three different maps. And you can also generate any map you want. And this is quite uh, important because if you are interested in the ratio of, uh, uh, for example, silicon divided by aluminum in any mineral, then you could simply type in your, your code ratio equals silicon divided by aluminum and XMAP tools would generate a map for that. And you already know about the add-ons and uh, one of the most important at the moment is this uh, add-on for thermodynamic modeling that implements being wanted to directly in XMAP tools. And if you are interested, there is one website for that. You just go there, you have to sign up and then you can simply give a try and download XMAP tools and give a try. This is again the procedure and I show here in the top what you need to do before to use X matters. You need to go to the microprobe and acquire your X-ray maps as you would do for any semi-quantitative uh, analysis. So even, even for example, there are uh, everyday papers that are published with X-ray maps that would be very easily calibrated. What you need to do is to have some spot analysis on the same area, uh, between five to 10 spots per uh, mineral that you have on the same area. And that would be used to calibrate the map. And then in XMAP tools, it would apply some corrections to the data you measure to the maps. Uh, it can, for example, correct for if you have a drift during the analysis. Then you do the classification to generate this masked image. This is a, a, an automated procedure. It's a supervised classification at the moment. And it's usually very quick, less than 30 seconds to, 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 cal to calculate this mask image. Uh, and then you have the calibration and, and uh, we provide an assisted calibration. Uh, so it's, a, it's an interface that will help you to, to do the calibration. I will describe the calibration in a moment and you will see it involves pseudo background correction. And then you can calculate uh, structural formulas. We have a, a large varieties of functions that are available and you can plot the data in any binary ternary diagram, uh, calculate maps of element ratio. Those are automated tools. So it's quite easy to use and quite uh, versatile. So just to, to show you how the calibration is performed, because this is quite important. Here I have an example of Garnet. That's the last time I'm talking about Garnet in this workshop. And on the left, you see the, the on the top left, you see an X-ray map for calcium K alpha for a, a quite large Garnet porphyroblast. And you see also some dots, and those are the spot analysis I measured on the same area. And the, the zoning is quite, uh, is quite uh, complex in this Garnet. Uh, you see that I excluded some spot analysis, for example, those that were measured at the, at the, at really at the limit between the two uh, different compositions, because those were mixing uh, compositions. And then what the program does is to take the, the spot analysis and the amount of uh, calcium oxide in white percent, and to take the intensity of the pixel that is just loca located underneath the spot analysis. And that would be the calcium K alpha in counts. And if you plot then the spot analysis versus pixel, you can easily define a calibration curve. That's the black uh, line here, the black curve. And with using this calibration curve, you can convert any calcium intensity into a weight percent. And that's exactly what the program is doing for the entire map after that. You see that we have an intercept that in a non-zero intercept here, we have 56 counts. And this is simply the background. If there is no calcium, in the, in the area we measure, then we would have a background that is this uh, Bram Shalom effect uh, that is 56 counts. So you, you even don't need to measure the background. All the other methods uh, that are, uh, for example, uh, apply a ZAF correction to every pixel would need in theory to have a background measurement. Uh, this is the, the example for manganese, I, I, the same garnet. And I, I put that to show you that we, we perfectly calibrate manganese between 0 to weight percent and about nine weight percent in this garnet with a simple linear calibration curve. So that's the strategy for calibration we use in XMAP tools. And then once you have the calibrated map, you can calculate a, a structural formula for every pixel of the image, and you can plot the data in a binary tool. And here we are looking at the, 
uh, uh, quantitative data, iron 2 plus in atom per formula unit in garnet versus calcium uh, in garnet. And we also calculated the, the FS3 plus in this uh, garnet. And you see that we have different groups. Of course, we have four different growth zones, and that's exactly what you see here. And one of the advantages of the, of the program is to give you a link between the distribution of the composition of in, in this diagram and the spatial distribution of the, the pixels in the map, of the, the pixel with this composition in your map. Uh, we can generate density maps that's showing the number of spots that are uh, the number of points that we have be, behind each uh, pixel on this image. Just to give you an, an idea here, we have about 600,000 uh, analysis of garnet in this diagram. And that's where you select groups. I did that manually very quickly, just selected a few groups. And the program will generate this image showing the distribution of each group with the same color. And you can then go to Garnet 1, Garnet 2, Garnet 3, and Garnet 4. You could generate masks for, uh, from each individual group and then look at how the zoning uh, in the Garnet would, would occur in, in each group. Because here we have some compositional zoning in each group of the Garnet. So that's about how you use XMAP tools. So now I want just to show you a, a few examples of applications, what we can do with the program. Coming back a bit to the modeling. Uh, yeah, we, we can use the, the, the mineral composition in a, in a clear micro uh, structural context. And this is a, one of the first examples I published with the program. Uh, we analyzed a, a, a nickel guide from Northwest Malaya, from Pakistan in the, the stack massive. And we mapped a very small area of this echo guide, and this is the, the phase map that you obtain with very different uh, with different uh, stages with garnet on facade peak assemblage, and then we have some uh, simplic tides forming uh, in this uh, uh, this intergroup as you can see on the on the on the phase map. And what we did is to simply use uh, semi empirical calibration to calculate pressure and temperature, but instead of using spot analysis, we used all the pixels uh, from the map. And for the peak conditions, for example, we use a, a simple uh, a, a calibration between garnet and CPX for temperature. We use the, the calibration of uh, Dave Waters for garnet CPX plus fungi. And that's what, what you obtain in these uh, uh, peak conditions. And then for the retrograde conditions, we apply different uh, equilibria, but again, two reactions, an you know, amphibole plagioclase thermometer from Holland and Blundy, and then the CPX amphibole plagioclase uh, Dave Waters was talking about in his uh, thermocal. Uh, uh, lecture on the first day. And that's how you, you obtain this pressure temperature. And the dispersion that you see here is simply the, the uncertainty that we have on the pixel composition. And if, they are, if there is some uh, small chemical variability in uh, for the each zones that were selected to calculate this diagram. A second example with uh, now other minerals. Here we are looking at a map of uh, uh, silicon in atom per formula unit in muscovite. And this is an example from Laura Eragi. And what she did is to, to say, look, we have two main foliations in this sample. One is horizontal. This is the S1. The second one is vertical. This is the S2. And, and you have the same uh, gr chemical groups in both uh, domains. So what she did is to separate the map into two different areas. And then she calculated how much of group one composition, so the high silicon content we have in, 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 the, in the first area, it's about 34 percent but we also have five percent in the second area and she could apply that to uh, really uh, study how the white mica would re-equilibrate in the two different uh, uh, micro uh, structures and then we can go one step further we can use again all the pixel compositions we can uh, do some fancy multi-equilibrium thermobarometry uh, here using a bit more advanced inverse models that what is available in for example thermocalc or tweak uh, this is a, a fungi quartz H2O calibration from Benoit Dubac. And here we, we calculated simply the pressure for this, uh, for this uh, map with all the pixels. And you see how the groups are uh, distributed. So high pressure for group one, lower pressure for a group two, about 10 kilobar, and then seven, eight kilobar for, for, from the la for the last group. And the interesting thing is we have a, now a correlation between, for example, silicon, extracted from the map and the pressure map that we calculate. And it's the same for the sodium content in this, uh, on, the, on the diagram on the right. One more example with white mica, because uh, uh, I love the complexity of white mica. Those are three different samples from uh, Spain. Uh, we, 
did some uh, uh, microprobe maps. On the left column, you see the, the silicon content in atom per formula unit. On the right column, you see the XMG. Every uh, row is a, a different sample. And it's quite interesting because we have only few white mica here with very high uh, silicon content, so very phengetic compositions. And I'm not sure you would you would really catch them if you only go and analyze this area with spot analysis, but you catch them on the map. And here in the second case, it's very interesting because we have a we have a very a very boring foliation, a very simple foliation. It's a S two here, and you see that in some bands. The, the white mica preserves a high silicon content in all the bands. It's a, it's a lower silicon content. Here we are again, the high silicon content. So the, the, the compositional record is quite complex and you can visualize it quite nicely on the map. And it's somehow correlated to the XMG. Uh, the third map is very similar to the first one with this high uh, fengitic white mica and uh, the lower silicon content uh, white mica in the in the main uh, foliation, and we can also do some thermal barometry. Here I'm using a forward model, and what I do is I just do isoplate thermal barometry using a, a a phase diagram, but for all the pixels of this image. So I calculate the intersection between the silicon isoplate the XMG, and I do that for all the pixels, and I see how this will be distributed in a in a temperature pressure diagram. And you see for the different generation, how do they form during the, the exhumation of the rock, the increase in temperature, now white mica will uh, re-equilibrate re in, in a very complex fashion in uh, the thin sections, at the thin section scale. So the last example I want to show is, uh, is uh, the case of, uh, of uh, high temperature rock. Now we are looking at migmatite. This one uh, comes from uh, uh, Central America. And what we have is two different domains. On the right, we have a, a leucosome, so a leucocratic domain. And on the left, on this image, we have a, a mel melanocratic domain. And in each domain, you have ver some very nice uh, uh, mineral relationship that you can, you can see. But my focus here is really to say, oh, if, if we look at the leucosome, for example, it looks like quite homogeneous uh, on this optical image. Now, if we, if we go to the phase map that we obtain uh, for this sample, you see that the leucosome that starts from about here and goes up to the right is more complex than what we think. We have different areas with different uh, 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 mineral, it's, it's similar mineral assemblage, but different mineral proportions. Here we have a, a first region with a lot of uh, Kefel spa. Then we have a region that is rich in, in plagioclase. And we have this quartz Kefel spa rich region uh, in between them. So this is something you immediately get with those uh, phase maps. And now I want to just to conclude to zoom in at the interface between uh, the residuum and the leucosome, because I just want to look at how the composition, the mineral composition are changing in this region. This is a, a map of alumina uh, in a weight percentage of alumina. And you see that we have quite a lot of variability. We see all the different phases. We have a biotite here, a lot of plagioclase, kefel spa. And then it gets more complicated in the, in the residuum. But the last image I, I want to show you is the, is the plagioclase. How is the, the composition of the plagioclase changing between the residuum and the leucosome? And this is the map, a map of the X anotite in plagioclase going from zero in blue to uh, one, uh, one in uh, red, which means that here, it would be pure albite, and to the reddish side, it would be almost pure anotite. And you see that we preserve almost all the compositions of the, of the plagioclase in this very, very small area. It's a, it's a, a, a few millimeters. So we have a, a, an anotite relict here in red. In the, in the leucosome, we have this uh, very nice uh, albite that is uh, forming probably from the crystallization of the melt. We have some very complex texture in between, and then on the in the residuum, we have a more intermediate composition of, of plagioclase. When you see that, then one might wonder what, what, what's the, the composition of the plagioclase I should use uh, in, my, in my phase diagram for this rock to try to, to estimate pressure and temperature conditions. So I, I think it, it, it's quite important to, to, to try to, to understand the rock and to acknowledge the, the complexity in the mineral composition of the that we observe in the minerals. And 
using compositional map, quantitative compositional map is, a, I think, is a, a very good strategy to try to, to, uh, to better understand our rocks. And I will leave you with that one, if, uh, if you are more interested to, to see more about X matters. That's great. Thanks very much, Pierre. Okay, I think we've got a few questions for you in the Q and A, um, and so we'll we'll go through these. I think we've got about ten minutes before we need to wrap up. Um, so, have there been? And hold on one second. How accurate is the automatic phase classification and identification? Does it ever return the wrong minerals? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, it will never give you the name of the mineral, so it's a classification. It will simply separate the all the pixels of the image it will classify into different groups uh, based on the chemistry depending on how many groups you want so if you want to classify this image into three groups it will put all the pixels in the in the three group and it will never give you the name and that's my motivation so if you do composition if you if you if you if you acquire compositional maps for your sample you have to know before you go to microprobe what phases are there so you have to know the name of your minerals and the software should never give you the name of your face. That's my personal opinion. Excellent. No, I like it. I think that's a, that's, that's a good philosophy. Okay. Have there ever been any comparisons of the quantitative mapping results of the data reduction scheme in XMAP tools versus the quantitative mapping results produced using EPMA man background collection? No, that's a good question. Uh, no, there is no, to my knowledge, there is no direct comparison between the two approaches. Uh, so just maybe to explain the question, what there is, there is a, a, a prop software that is a, a software from John Donovan, and, and what they do is they calibrate each pixel using a ZAF correction. So they apply a ZAF correction to each pixel, and as they can't measure the background, what they do is they approximate the background, and it's a it's a very it's a it's a very good approximation. So I would say for the approximation, it's a it's a good approximation. So the background value is probably quite uh, good in a prop software. First, it takes forever to calculate, especially if you have a one million pixels as uh, it is on this image. And then I have never really tested this myself because I haven't coded the ZAF correction in XMAP tools. But the the problem to me is that the the precision in, of, uh, of the intensity on each pixel is quite large. So you would propagate that to the, the ZAF uh, parameter, to the values of the correction that you apply. So I would not calculate uh, a, a ZAF or Z, A, and F parameter for each pixel. So I think this might have some, uh, it, it might have some small difference. Here, the quality of the map is as good as your spot analysis. If, if your spot analysis are good and accurate, the map will be very accurate. If the spot analysis are bad, then the map will be bad. It's as simple as that. Excellent, great. Thanks, Pierre. Um, okay, is there a minimum resolution for the probe map, the pixel size, where the efficacy of XMAP tools and being a antidote drops off so that the uncertainties in the calibration are unacceptable? uh yes uh, it the the, the, pr the problem is not on the problem is on the electron microprobe side is not in the, in the software so i i could use i could use a map that is measured at a nanometer scale in xmap tools and if you have if you have the if you have the data that are good and there is no not too much mixing between the two different phases then the program will will handle that quite easily now here the here this is about how we can go now and the, on this map we have a one micron resolution so we scan every one micron so one pixel is a, uh, the, the diameter of one pixel is a, is one micron uh, we have a lot of mixing so i don't have the image but we we published a, a paper where we estimate the the, the 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 size of the interaction volume in the sample for every pixel of this image and then you see that we have overlap so yes we have a lot of mixing pixels for example, in the simplex type between the pyroxene and the, and the plagioclase. It is a problem, but I would say for the calibration, it's not really a problem because in the end, the composition will be between a, a pyroxene and a plagioclase. So it will be a mixing composition even on the map at the end. So I think we, we, we do a pretty good job in the calibration. Okay, great. Thanks, Pierre. Next question. Um, 
it, when you're conducting spot analyses, there's often beam damage in micas. Is there still damage when you do a map or is this less because the measurements were a shorter time and a shorter pixel? This is an excellent question. And uh, if you have beam damage during your analysis, you should just not use the, the analysis. Simply, it's as simple as that. Because the problem is even, even if you measure sodium first, for example, in, in, a, in a plagioclase or in a white mica, uh, and you measure silicon on the same crystal after, if you start diffusing sodium in your white mica, just by, by simple uh, mass balance, the, the, the silicon will increase. So the intensity of silicon will increase. So you will overestimate your silicon as well. So it's not only the problem that you lose sodium, but the problem that it will affect also the, uh, the other elements. So yes, you see it in the map. So for example, this is one of the first map I acquired. And in my plagio case, where I have the spot analysis, I, I will see the effect of the spot analysis. So which means that the plagio case composition is not perfect in this case. Uh, in all the other maps, and I have many, I have never seen again the effect of the spot analysis. So we, we use la uh, uh, large spot size, and we try to, to, to ensure that there is no diffusion in the crystal. And that would also be a problem if you use the, if you use, um, if you, if you try to apply a ZAF correction, uh, it can also be a problem. Here, maybe one sh quick comment on that. If, if we have, for example, diffusion of calcium, in this map. So if, if for example, we analyze uh, another element first and then calcium after, and imagine we have, we have lost 20% of the calcium. On my calibration, it doesn't matter at all because I will calibrate using the spot analysis and the composition of the spot analysis is correct. Just the intensity will be affected by diffusion. So by using this uh, internal standardization approach, even if you have diffusion, you can somehow always come back to a right value after once you, cali you calibrate the map. And this is why this approach, I, I, I would say, is much better if you, for example, uh, you, you map uh, glass in meteorites or, or yeah, this kind of uh, very sensitive, beam sensitive material. Excellent, great. No, that's good points there, Pierre. Okay, do you have any comments on using EDS maps calibrated with pro point analyses? Uh, I have no problem. I, I'm using EDS quite a lot huh? because uh, sometimes I just put five elements on the WDS, the most important, and all the other one on the EDS. Uh, I have no problem ex except that you there are things you won't see. So if, if you want to map, for example, uh, uh, so, uh, sodium in plagioclase, I think. Oh, no, sodium in white mica. Uh, I'm not sure you will see much on the EDS map because the background is so high on the EDS that Probably for the short dwell time we have, you, you won't see it. But I have a very old EDS detector here, so I can't really see. Maybe with the new detectors, the solid state it would be better. OK, great. Thank you. All right, next question. Uh, I assume you need to standardize for every mineral in the rock. Do you have a feeling for how zoned a mineral can be before you need to separately standardize each zone? No, you, you have to, yeah, so it's correct. You have to standardize for each mineral. So for example, yeah, here, here is a standardization for garnet. And you see that it works even if the garnet is zoned. So it means that the matrix effect in the garnet are, uh, are not so important between the rim and the core. So we can assume a linear uh, calibration curve, for, for example, for, the, for this extreme uh, variation in garnet composition. Uh, this is not true if, for example, I have a plagioclase in the same uh, area then I, I can't use this calibration curve to calibrate plagioclase simply because of the matrix effect. So plagioclase will have a different, a different calibration curve. Probably the background will be very close, but this, the, the slope of the, of the calibration curve will be quite different. And if you, if, you, if you do that, if you calibrate everything, for example, all the pixels with this calibration curve, you introduce at least 5% uh, difference on your on your, on your total, I would say it's a, it's at least five percent. Okay, great, thanks. I think that answers that, Pierre. Um, someone asking here: Is XMAP tools compatible with other softwares other than Ferac Domino? So Thermocalcum, Perplex. No, it it, it is not. It, it is not viable. Uh, it is not compatible with Thermocalc simply because uh, there is no Gibbs energy minimization in Thermocalc more than this, uh, the, the Dogmin. I think the name is Dogmin. Yep. That is very slow, if I understood correctly. So no, it is not compatible with Thermocalc. Uh, the compatibility with Perplex, I, I mean, I don't have it. Bec 
there are several reasons for that. And one of the main reasons for me is that the, that the perplex is evolving too often. So we have a new version of perplex every few weeks, and it's impossible to, to maintain a compatibility with perplex. Okay, I think that answers that. And I'll have one last quick question before we go back to Dave. Um, is XMAP Tools a finished project pro pro product, or is there additional development and functionality that's coming down the pipeline in the future? No, it's definitely not. And at the moment, we are limited by this. Uh, the, the, the version that is here is a MATLAB dependent program. And we will be moving on to a new version probably soon. And I hope to announce something later this year. But there will be, there will be a. So we are putting some efforts to, to get free of MATLAB in the future. Thanks for the question. No, excellent. No, I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm sure many of the people in the audience are. It was one of the um, most, the favorite topic of people when they answered the, the registration, they wanted to know about XMAP tools. So I'm really glad we've got to talk about this.